Welcome to OutDrive, folks. I'm your host, Cliff Callis, and each week I'm bringing you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. OutDrive is powered by Callis, a full-service advertising agency with a focus on marketing rural America. Callis offers a wide range of integrated marketing services, including website development, search engine marketing, social media, video, and digital. We develop strategic and creative campaigns to build your brand and your business. And you can learn more about us at ecalis.com. Now join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. We've got another great story to share with you today about life and work in rural America. I'm excited to welcome professional angler, announcer, and crappie master tournament spokesperson, Brian Sowers, to our podcast. Brian is the MC and USA Tournament Director for Crappie Masters, the nation's premier crappie fishing tournament trail. As the National Tournament Director for 2022, he was the voice of the Crappie Masters All-American Tournament Trail, Crappie USA Tournament Trail, and King Cat Tournament Trail, presented by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's National Sponsorship Team. Prior to his current gig, he hosted a radio show for KMMO Radio in Marshall, Missouri. And during the Missouri State Fair, you can find him on the fairgrounds as the MC for the annual State Fair Parade and Flag Retreat. Welcome to Drive, Brian. Hey, how you doing? Hey, I'm doing great. Nice fall day here in Missouri. A little breezy. Cool starting to come. I, I can see winter out ahead. I'm not that excited about it, but the fall season's right upon us, and it's awesome. You know what's you know what's coming upon us? The what's best that? fishing part of the year. Okay, that's good. That's a good way to start this. <laughs> Talk about what makes it the best fishing time of the year. Well, you run through two different seasons when it comes to fishing season. You know, a lot of people have always thought, we'll, we'll base it right now on crappie fishing since that's what I do. And you run through the two different seasons. People always thought that you could catch crappie in the spring only, but that's not the case. You can catch crappie all year long. And in the fall, it's such a beautiful time to be out. The lakes aren't as busy this time of the year with recreational boaters. The fish are feeding up for the wintertime. You get a chance to see for here in Missouri, you get a chance to see all the foliage out there, the colors of the trees. You hear the turkeys gobble. You know, it's just such an amazing time out there to see deer out there running around. It's just an amazing time to be on the water and still catch big fish. It's such a fun time to be out there right now. And we've got a lot of great places in Missouri to catch crappie, don't we? From northeast to southeast, northeast to southwest. How about that? (laughs) Whatever. That's pretty (laughs) good. All over the state, we have have plenty of places to go. I'm not going to ask you to talk about your favorite places to fish because I don't want to highlight one over another. But let's go back and just uh, pick up your background. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. Wow. That's that's a long story. We only have a short amount of time. Literally, to try to take a long story and make it short, a friend of mine, Brad Klosterman, he and I started a show called In the Outdoors of Brian on radio, on KMMO Radio, which I had done the morning show and all that, you know, for years. And we were fishing some bass tournaments. Funny story, fishing bass tournaments. And we were not very good in the bass fishing world and tournament fishing. Not good at all. And my wives finally told us and said, either you all figure out something else because we can't eat spaghetti every weekend and y'all don't bring fish home <laughs> like you promised. Or you're going to figure out something else or quit the tournament trail because it costs you money to go fish. So my partner Brad said, hey, you, you're you on radio. Why didn't we start a radio show? So we did. In the Outdoors of Brad and Brian. Now it's In the Outdoors of Brian. Brad had retired from it. And we had a sponsor, Paul Alpers with Crappie Masters, had met Brad at Brian's Osage Outdoors when they were on 135 at the Lake of the Ozarks. Anyway, they met. They became a sponsor of it. We got to be being a sponsor that Paul had asked their the gentleman who was speaking for them at the time had some health problems, said, can you do the announcing for it? And it just manifested itself from there. Mike Valentine bought the company from Paul Alpers. Mike offered me a full-time job, which I turned down the first time, took it the second time, and it's gone from here and there and now sold back, and I'm back in, in, and doing it full-time. It's my full-time job. So that's how I got started in the business. Completely unexpected. 
but that's how I got started. I think that's the greatest way things occur today is just, you know, it just kind of falls into place. You know, it's right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's, it's something I really love to do. And like I said, I never thought I would be able to do it. I never thought I would be able to do radio, much less do what I do now. So what's your background for radio? How'd you get into that? How'd you get started? <laughs> Cliff, you are wanting long stories here, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> so I was actually working at KMMO at the time, or not working at KMMO at the time. I was the president of the Waverly JCs, and KMMO was a sponsor, radio sponsor of our Apple Jubilee. Jim Cox, who was a salesman there, said, hey, you ever thought about doing radio? Because I had a mobile DJ business at the time. Mm -hmm. It tells you how long that goes back. And he said, hey, we need some part-time help. I said, okay. I said, why not? You know, I'll do that. Because I've been a mobile DJ. Well, doing a mobile DJ business and radio business, as you well know, is two different things. Mm -hmm. So I started out on Sunday mornings, on all religious programming on Sunday mornings. And I'll never forget, here's a great story for all of you out there to start in any business like this. And your first person that tells you you can't do it, don't believe him quite yet. I asked my mother after my first show, I said, Mom, what did you think about how I did on my first day on the air? She goes, you need to go back to farming, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. So, but anyway, that's, that's how it all kind of started. And then it kind of went from there. I continued to do the morning show until Mike Valentine bought it. Then I went full-time there. I had come back. I had left for a little bit. Came back, ag director. I was ag director at KMMO for 10 years, which we'll, we'll get into later on how that all kind of worked out with crappie fishing. But that's how it all started for me. It's just every chance I had, I had no radio experience, no training, no anything, just learned off the fly. And that's how it started. That's a great story. So is your background farming? You grew up on a farm? Yes, farming, running dozers, and construction. And so... That's my family was Sowers Construction, but we had farmland and, you know, there were times where I was out there when it was like this and even colder that, you know, your dad said, go out there and clean the, those dozer tracks out. They got to run today. So we did all of that all the time, farming, construction and all that kind of stuff. So it's always been a passion for me. Agriculture is what I grew up in, still into it and still work with it. So it really worked out well to where I could do what I do today and bring farming into it. Well, and that gave you probably lots of opportunities to sneak away down to the farm pond, drop a pole in the water, drop a line in the water. Once or twice. Once or twice. <laughs> Have you always loved fishing? Yeah, it's something, you know, I, somebody asked me that recently, and I thought back about that. Of course, Dad, when we were younger, of course, Dad, and they were already gone. They were doing bid jobs around the country with construction and things like that and farming and all that stuff, and Dad went home a lot. But we did have a pond that was close by, and we decided, you know, you can only do so much stuff running around with your brother and all that kind of stuff. So we said, hey, why don't we go fishing and all that kind of stuff and just fell in love with it at that point in time. And that that passion has never left. Well, you've got a great story from your ag background, farming, growing up on a farm, fishing as a kid, getting a start in radio and an outdoor show on the radio still. And now, you know, USA Tournament Director for Crappie Masters. Tell us about Crappie Masters as an organization. And Crappie Masters is, without a doubt, the number one crappie organization, crappie tournament fishing organization out there. Now, this year, we're introducing Crappie Masters Elite, which is a whole different type trail, which involves 50 anglers that they'll be winning substantial amounts of money. We'll continue to have the Crappie Masters National Qualifiers but also Crappie USA and American Crappie Trail. So it started out when I was with Crappie Masters. Like I said, I started with Paul Alpers, Mike Valentine as the number one tournament trail. And the goal was to be able to not only provide an opportunity for the anglers to make as much money as possible, but also it's important to promote the anglers as much as possible. And secondly and thirdly, to bring other people in there, whether it be, you know, the kids, whether it be that second tier angler, whatever the case may be, the point was to grow the sport. The Everything was the goal of you had Bassmaster, MLF, all that kind of stuff. We knew that there were so many people out there that wanted to crappie fish and pan fish 
that felt left out. You know, and it used to be the old boys club and all that kind of stuff. We want to take into a modern type era, which we have absolutely accomplished, what you're seeing now in the prize money, what the anglers do, how they promote themselves. So it, it's been a win-win all the way through. The growth continues. I mean, when we started, you know, you thought, okay, we get to this level, we're good. Then it went to this level. Now it goes to another level with Blake and Angela Jackson to where now we're competing with the same numbers social media wise as bass and everybody else. That's awesome. So how many tournaments can a person fish in over the course of a year? It really depends on which trail they want to go or multiple trails. We will do, and I, and I didn't look that number up. So I apologize Cliff on that. On the elite trail, you had to already be a member of it. The elite trail is something totally different this year. That's never happened in the crappie fishing industry. There were 50 teams that were allowed in. They had to pay $6,000 up front to fish those tournaments. There are five tournaments. They will fish for a total of a $50,000 prize at their championship. The national qualifiers, and some of those teams on the elite, there's a lot of rules going to it, like the, the final 10 or out of the 40, you know, then other people can move up. The national qualifiers, there will be seven of those and a national championship. Crappie USA has a, a situation to where we have amateur and pro side. So if you're somebody just wants to start, you can come in as an amateur, fish for a good prize money, and those tournaments go from east all the way to the Midwest, south to the north. I mean, they go everywhere. And ACT, we're still working on that one. It's kind of a rebuild a little bit, but we're looking at something that's going to be really fun with that you need to pay attention to coming up. So do you need to be a member first to participate yes. in these tournaments? Yes. For uh, crappie masters, and the bulk of those are going to be around $50. Okay. $50 so, membership, which allows you to fish anywhere you want to fish. So let's just stop here and let our audience know, if they wanted to find out more information about these tournaments, what website would you send them to? I would go to crappiemasters.net. Follow us on Facebook, too. Uh, you can go to the Facebook page. Same thing with Crappie USA. You can go to the website there. You can also go on Facebook and ACT. You can go on that. And we also are a part of American Bass Trail, too, this year. So for all the bass fishermen out there listening to the podcast, there's an opportunity for them to be involved, too. Has Crappie Masters broken into television as well, streaming TV? We have been on television on the Pursuit Channel for years. Since I was been a part of it, we were on Pursuit Channel at their earliest stages. Crop USA has also a television show. ACT has a television show. So we've got television shows all over that will be on the Pursuit Channel. We are also involved when it comes to social media. For instance, on Crappie Masters, every day we do multiple updates on our Crappie Masters Facebook page, which you also see with Crappie USA and the others, where we'll do multiple updates on Facebook Live and YouTube Live through the day. We do different things all the way through the year on all the, the channels, Crappie Masters, USA, and ACT, where we have anglers out there that are giving tips and techniques on the water things, all kinds of stuff out there. It's an information overload, and it's just not on Facebook and website. We're involved in TikTok now. We're involved in Instagram, all of it. Every social media outlet that's out there you will find information out there for you to become a better angler. And, that, and that's the whole goal. You know, whether it be the tournament anglers or the weekend angler like I am, I consider myself a weekend angler. You know, I want to learn. I learn from these guys, you know, so it gives me an opportunity to go out there and see what you have going on, how I can be better every weekend. Yeah, so there's an educational component to all this. Absolutely. Without the education part of it, we don't bring, you know, that's one of the things, Cliff, that's been such a, Kind of an amazing thing in this industry is we've seen these kids come in. A part of that is what, you know, everybody talks about live scope and forward-facing sonar and all that. But that's been something we've seen. Everybody calls it a video game. But these kids that are in their teens, early 20s, 30s, are coming out there and winning the biggest tournaments out there. Really? We have a team out there with a 23-year-old, 22 or 23-year-old, Hayden Jeffries and his dad, Dan Jeffries, out of Mississippi, they've won 15 tournaments this year, including two national championships. This is a 22, 23-year-old looking at 
sonar and winning national championships. That's incredible. Learn how to fish. And it, it's really, for me, being in this business so long, it's really rewarding to see when I started, the demographic was more the median age was in the mid 50s. We've seen that median age go down to the low 40s now, including everybody. So it's gone dramatically, you know, to a younger generation coming into the sport. They really enjoy it. And it's fun to catch the fish. I mean, it's, it's, Absolutely. You, you know, you go catch them. You know, you can't do it during tournament hours, but you go fish all week. You can take some at home to, you know, put on, you know, put in the grease or on the grill, whatever. So it, it's really been a rewarding experience to see the educational aspect of it and, and getting those younger kids with kids fishing rodeos. Crappie USA, for instance, just real quick, and I know we're running short of time. We just talked about that last weekend. We had the Crappie USA National Championship. We did that over Kentucky Lake in Paris, Tennessee. To date, Crappie USA gives every dime that they collect the raffles and whatever the case is with scholarships. As of that day, last Saturday, Crappie USA has given away $400,000 in scholarships. That's awesome. You know, and these kids get a chance to go to trade schools, four-year colleges, you know, whatever the case may be, to further their education. Whether they continue to fish or not, that's not the point. The point is to get them to grow, and it's been extremely successful. Well, I think the fact that your average age is coming down so significantly really bodes well for the sport. Yeah, absolutely. I, and I think that the same way. I, I think there's going to be more and more. And we talk to those younger guys, you know, and there's competition between those guys as much as there is, you know, guys my age. Sure. So they all like to come into it. And we're fortunate enough to have male, female teams and adult youth teams come in. And that adult youth team is being has grown exponentially as well. You know, father and son teams are they're kind of ruling the ruling the whole thing right now, which so, is great to see. Yeah, that is you know, family sport. That's all about, yeah. you know, life out in rural no America. Doubt. So do you think it's different recreational fishing versus tournament fishing? Absolutely. In what way? When you're talking about recreational fishing, you're out there to catch just fish. You know, you are keeper fish. An example, like in the Ozarks. Now, I'm looking for it. I don't, because I'm involved in the sport, I don't try to in, in, infringe upon tournament waters. And I'll explain mm -hmm. that real quick. I'll go out there to try to catch 9 to 11 inch fish, eater fish, you know, keeper fish. Sure. And that's that's what I try to catch. You know, if I luck into a big one, great. That's fine. The key and the difference between recreational fishing and tournament fishing is that you have seven bites that you have to get. Now, you may catch 80 fish, but you're looking for only seven fish. And the key and makes the difference between tournament winners and ones that don't win a lot is you have to learn and find out where and why big fish live. Because big fish live in areas where other fish don't, and they kind of roam together. Class of schools live together. Nine, ten-inch fish tend to be with nine and ten-inch fish. Big fish will live in certain areas, then you have to be the one to find those. So it's a totally different deal. You're focusing on seven big bites, not a hundred little bites. That makes sense. And it, and it makes sense that if you're a little fish, you don't want to really be hanging out with the big ones, right? Well, no, we're any out there. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about social media and you've talked about video. What are some other ways that you're getting your message out to anglers or potential anglers or potential tournament members? Well, there's a, you know, we do also paper, you know, we do flyers, things like that, doing local radio in towns we go to, things like that. My show in the outdoors of Brian, it's an all outdoor show. But we tend to focus a lot more on crappie just because of that's what I do. Sure. But there's just everything that's out there that's a possibility, whether it be handing the flyer out on the street corner to a poster in a window to TikTok videos, everything in between. It all encompasses everything, and that's what we do to promote it. Yeah, I think that's a great approach because it's integrated. You're doing lots of different things. They all work together to make everything more strong, and you're trying to reach people where they are whether it's on Instagram or it's TikTok, because you've got a lot of different age groups that you're trying to hit. Yeah. And, and there's so many different mediums in which to hit them. Yeah. And that, you know, gets to the point to where there are people out there still 
and everybody thinks it's funny, but it's it's true. Not everybody has internet and all this stuff, and they want to see that flyer in the window. They want that trifold in their hand where they can go pick it up. Just like still people want a newspaper. You still have to do that, but you also have to be as far as advanced as doing TikTok and Instagram and everything else. You have to go from one end of the spectrum to the other, or you're going to cheat yourself out of potential fishermen and also the education aspect of it. So do you do any targeting on a geographical basis or basically you're just advertising across the entire United States? Well, when it comes to all of our social media, it goes all across the United States, but we have our tournaments. You know, we're targeting that too, but we want everybody up until the last two years, one of the biggest watching states of crappie masters television was California. We've never had a tournament in California. Really? That's never. interesting. But, you know, there's there's fish in all the lower 48, so everybody's got crappie, so everybody's interested in learning about it. Because it's a fish that they could target, and they can take the family out and do it, too. Yeah. You know, that's one of the things I talk about all the time is it doesn't really matter what kind of fishing, but fishing doesn't age discriminate. You can start fishing from day number one, and you can fish to the last day you're on the earth. There's nothing in between that says you can't fish anymore. And we really promote that, the crappie master's family, all that, because we think it's important that, first off, everybody get in the outdoors and enjoy what we have. And getting the kids in the outdoors, you know, getting them away from the television, video games, and all that kind of stuff. Go out there and see what you can do. And, you know, I always say, we got a lot more to talk about, but I always tell people, you know, buy the kid a tackle box, not an Xbox. Well said. Well said. <laughs> That's my motto when it comes to kids fishing rodeos and education to the parents, because you're educating parents as much as you're educating the kids. Absolutely. So what do you think it takes to be a good crappie fisherman? Time on the water. Absolutely. Learning from every bite. People talk about, I learn from every bite. Learning fish behavior, feeding habitat, how when they move up, when they move down, if they spook, how far do they go? That's what sets the difference apart and, and just going, you know what? There's a lot of people that say, well, fish aren't biting this weekend or, you know, they're just not biting. It wasn't my day. Fish eat every day at some point. You, your goal is to be there at that time. But the biggest key is time on the water. You can't learn what a fish does if you're not on the water. It's that simple. And how important do you think it is to be out on a boat versus a dock? There, it's it's two different entities, to be honest with you. You can learn a lot from a dock, too. But I fish from a dock a lot of part of my day, mm -hmm. you know, at the lake. So, you know, you learn a lot from the dock if you have brush and stuff like that. But, yeah, being in the boat is going to give you a, a greater advantage because you can see transition areas, whether it's a ledge, whether there's – you know, bluff or it's a flat if there's trees out there for structure out there. So, yeah, being in a boat's important about it, too. doesn't mean you can't catch them off the dock. If you put things out there, if you don't have it, put things out there, the fish can attract to you. You know, crappie relate to structure. Little times they'll be out there just roaming, obviously. But, you know, at some point, like what we have here in Missouri, God guarantee you, Right now, you better be on trees and structure if you're going to go catch crappie right now. Because they're going to go, Ooh. <laughs> they're like everybody else. They're going inside going, what is going on? <laughs> it's cold out here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let's take a little different track. You've been sure. in radio a long time. What do you think it takes to be successful in a radio career? <laughs> Not get involved in fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and i'll just go off my experience it goes back to what mom said i knew that i love farming and i love agriculture i always wanted to be a part of it and wanted to be a part of that industry and i still do i still love it but it just wasn't i guess my calling and i said you know what i don't have official training but i can make myself into this and i listened to people who had been involved in the radio for many many years and they helped me through it. Randall Wiseman was my mentor coming up. A lot of people may be listening remember Randall Wiseman, Jess Spurgeon, some of those guys that back in those days, you know, said you really got to focus on this and how you 
you know, how you approach talking, how you do it on the air, it's different, your attitude on the air. And I'll never forget the best advice that I was ever given in radio because everybody has bad days and they have good days. That's the way it is. Sure. Randall Wiseman told me, he goes, Brian, I'm going to tell you something about the radio business. Two things. He said, I'm going to teach two things. When you act like you don't care, it takes one switch of that dial to make people not come back. When they go away from you, you're more often than not, they won't come back. And he also said, you may be having the worst day of your life, but you know what your job is? Is to make everybody out there listening feel like it's the best day of their life. Well, that's great insight, isn't it? That's what I said, you know what? I get it now. So every day I went into that studio, whether I wasn't feeling good or whatever was going on in your family life or whatever, I walked in there and I said, I'm putting on the show and I'm going to entertain everybody out there and I'm going to make them laugh and I'm going to make them have a good time and make them glad they tuned into that radio station. Yeah, you know, I've always thought that work, whatever it is, gives you the opportunity to leave all that behind and really focus on the job that you've got to do. Absolutely. Because it's important to everybody out there. You know, they don't want to listen to that. They want to listen to you. They want to be entertained. They want to have a good time. And that's what we did with the morning show. Make jokes, laugh. You know, the best part of my day is people doing a joke of the day with Ken Llewellyn, who's a legend in that industry. You know, people call in and go, tell him to stop it. Ken's going to have a heart attack. He's, he's about to die there on the air. He's laughing so hard. And we just about ran off the road. <laughs> that's all you got to hear. <laughs> that's awesome. So now you're, you're also the MC for the Missouri state fair parade as yeah. well as the flag retreat during the fair. Yes. Did, did your radio background lead you to that role? Yeah, it did. And also being the ag director for 10 years. too. I think it was a culmination of all of that kind of got involved with that. Now, in 2011, I had the Missouri Department of Agriculture Broadcast of the Year Award, and I got to be friends with Mark Wolf, the fair director, Kerry and everyone. And at the time, they kind of ran through a, a different rotation of different announcers to do the parade. And it kind of just ended up to where they asked me if I would just plan on doing it every year. And, you know, I had a love, even before I did that, I was covering the fair all those years. You know, I was working with the Missouri Pork Association, corn, beans, cattlemen, everybody, sheep, you know, whatever. So I've had relationships with everybody out there in the agriculture world. So it was a really easy job for me to do. And then when it came up a few years back with the military flag retreat ceremony, I was asked to do that. That was a very simple thing to do. And that was an easy yes, and it's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. To know that the freedoms we have today are because of these people that are recognized there, and so many others, you know, millions of others that are out there today, you know, serving and, you know, the families along with those out there serving. But to see those people, to hear the stories, to see the sacrifice and the struggle they went through to make this country be and enjoy the freedoms we have today. There's no bigger honor than to be just a small part of that to recognize those. So for me to do that is one of the biggest honors I've ever received in my life. Yeah, there are some really great stories from those men and women who have done that. Of course, you're a natural to fall into that role. I just think you have the perfect background for that. On a personal level, what do you love about the fair? You've got to love the fair. <laughs> I'll tell you, I've loved the fair for as long, as far back as I can remember. My love, you know, at this point, I love seeing all the people. When you go there every year, you make so many friends. So going back to see the friends, just the atmosphere, the highlight of seeing, you know, the new things, seeing all those new kids. I mean, I've got kids that I used to do with FFA interviews and 4-H interviews. Those kids have grown up to become FFA teachers, leaders, everything out there. And to see their kids come up, it's just like fishing. You see the families come up through it and you go, man, I got to see this in person. And I think it's one thing that we take for granted, but we don't appreciate enough. Just like that, you know, I get to go there every year. Yes, I know friends from back, but I get to make new friends every year. 
I get to see those families again, and, you know, get to say hi, and meet the grandkids and all that kind of stuff. So you see the progression all the way through. You see the love and the passion for the fair. You see the love and the passion for agriculture and what they're doing, what they believe in. And you know that the world's in better hands. When I leave the state fair and talk with all those people and all those kids and all their families and those new leaders coming up there, I know the world's in better hands than we think it is. Amen. Amen, brother. You've got to travel all over the place. Yeah. In your job and, and maybe, you know, for recreation. Where do you like to go the best? There's certain region of the country or a certain part of the world that you really like? Yeah, Missouri. <laughs> boy. That's what I was hoping you said. That was a setup question. I was yeah. hoping that's what hey, you were going to say. I'll, I'll be honest with you, Cliff. I do get travel. I do like some places. I love Grenada, Mississippi, just because of the fishery itself, because I had a chance to see something I've never seen before, and I don't know I'll ever see again there this year with a spring tournament. I had a chance to weigh four four-pound fish. I've wow. never seen a four-pound crappie, and I got to see four and weigh them. That's a big highlight. I love Grenada, Mississippi. I love the St. John's River around the land, Florida. Such a beautiful fishery. It's old Florida and things like that. But there's nothing better, no matter where I travel, whether it's Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, all across the country. And when I come back, whether it be from north, south, east, or west, there's no better feeling when I see that welcome to Missouri sign. I guarantee you. I call my wife and I go, that's the best thing. I said, I'm back home. So what do you love about Missouri? Everything. I just love it because it's so diverse. There's so much friendship. There's loyalty. You know, you have all the seasons, but it's the people. It's the people themselves. Yeah, I love the fisheries. Love all that. But, you know, like I said, I've got a chance to meet thousands and thousands of people, make thousands of friends. And it's their love for what they do. You know, it's just, it's different. Everybody has a love for what they do, but it's just a little different in Missouri. I mean, you know, I can go to the state fair and I can go to talk to the pork producers, you know, the Cattlemen's Association, Corn Growers Association, which we've had such a long standing relationship in promoting, you know, E10 fuel and boats for years and years and years with the Missouri Corn Merchandising Council. It's just, it's home. It, it feels like home and it's just something that, it's hard to explain into words. It just makes you feel like, you know, you're in that place. It goes back to the old, the Vanderbilt deal. You know, you got to show me. And Missouri always shows me every time I come back. Well, it does. It's, it does. It's, it's, it's just a, a wonderful place with such diversity and so many different things, so many seasons, the farm ground, uh, you know, still to this day, you know, yeah, I'm in the fishing business, but there's nothing like turning over the dirt in the spring and, that smell of the dirt. There's nothing like the smell of harvest out there going on right now. Nothing like that deer hunting season. And there's just so many things out there that it's just a place that I've, I was born and raised in. It's a place I live and die in. Heaven on earth. Absolutely. <laughs> so you mentioned some of the ag commodity groups that help you with your tournaments. If somebody was out there listening today and they were interested in being a sponsor, Sure. Talk a little bit about how that works. Well, we have different levels, obviously. Going back to, and I, if you don't mind, I would like to, to mention this. With the Missouri Corn Merchandising Council, we've had a long-standing relationship with them. And for a while, Renewable Fuels Association. And for a while, Missouri Soybean Association. But Missouri Corn has been a sponsor for a long, long time with us. And they have given bonuses because what we wanted to do which came back to where my background came from, is educate the boating industry that E10 fuel is safe to use in your boat. It's all major marine engine manufacturers approve it. We have every winter on the crappie master side for over six years, every tournament all across the country was using E10 fuel on their boat, which they won a bonus for that too. They won a $500 bonus for using E10 fuel on their boat. <laughs> We've never had any complaints about it, never had any issues with it. We polygraph people. They pass polygraphs on it. So we know that it's a working product, saves people money. And my gosh, with the price of gas right now, why wouldn't you want to put a little cheaper gas in there? It's going to perform just the same as 
going paying $2 or more for premium that That's you right. don't need because you can go get the, the 87. I've got a 1992 Nitro. It's never known anything but 87. It would be very angry with me if I put something different in it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it culminates to bring, you know, that kind of stuff into it, the agriculture world into it. We promoted, you know, biodiesel, different products where we use there. So if somebody wants to come on board, whether it be in the ag industry or whatever, they can give me a call or they can message me, whatever the case may be. My number is 660 351 2791. Or they can go look me up on Facebook and Messenger or Brian K. Sowers at gmail.com. But what we have is an opportunity to get your product out there to over 20 million people right now that are like minded people. These are families. You know, we're selling, we're, we're pushing products out there that we believe in. We don't just take everybody. Products we believe in, we know that work will help you catch more fish, like fuel. We know that's going to save you money. It's going to be productive for you. And it just gives everybody an opportunity to get out there to families. You know, one thing I learned is when we talk about it in a fishing type atmosphere, people tend to listen more about the product and the story. And we think that's what our job is, to go out there and make things bigger, better, grow businesses better out there. And we work hard every day. It's not just tournament fishing. We work hard every day to make everybody successful out there, whether it be the weekend angler, the business out there, whatever the case is. Sounds like a great advertising opportunity to me. It really yeah. is. It really is something I firmly believe in. As an angler, I'm going to give you the opportunity to tell us your best crappie master fishing story. Because <laughs> I know you got one or a hundred. Well, yeah, I got a bunch of them. Gosh, the best one. Can I tell you, Dave? Yes, you can. I was fishing with Mike Valentine on the St. John's River in Lake Woodruff down there. And I'm not a guy that likes to fish in storms. It's not my thing. We're And this is a big, wide open. If anybody is fishing in Florida out there that listens, they know. Hundreds of boats out there. Storm coming. I said, you know, the lightning's kind of getting a little close. I'd kind of like to go on in. No, no, no. We're on fish. We're going to stay out here for a little bit. Because that didn't bother me. I said, what well, kind of bothers me? So it gets closer. And I said, Mike. Did you notice if you look around that we're the only boat left out here? I'm thinking that's for a reason. <laughs> it was <laughs> it was literally about that time. All of a sudden, I saw his fishing line raise up in the air. And I went, oh, no, it's a static electricity. So he hooks into a fish at that point in time. And it's a big fish. You can tell. It's a big fish. Well, the static electricity getting hard enough, his hands were shaking like this. I mean, his, his arm was shaking. I said, let go. We got to go. He goes, I'm not letting go until it comes in. You can see him in pain. He finally swung that thing in. He goes, see, it was a two-pounder. I went. He goes, I said, take me. He goes, I'm, I'm going to stay fishing. I'll take you to the bank. I said, well, that's not a very good choice because the only thing that lives over there is alligators. So I had to stay out there. So <laughs> that was one of those experiences and really probably the one of the best experiences with this year at Grenada getting a chance to weigh fish like that seeing an average of 3.19 pounds by Matthew and Bruce Rogers out of Missouri win a tournament but seeing four four pound fish at 426 I, I just can't even explain to anybody out there listening or watching how big those fish are you know it's something I never thought I would ever see much less to see four of them in one day or a weekend. So that's probably the best thing I've ever seen in, in the industry. Besides the kids winning and things like that, you know, that's always rewarding too. But, man, to see something like that happen that you never thought you'd ever see, and i got to, you know, got to be part of history. That's pretty cool. Small part, very small part, <laughs> but a <but> part. <laughs> So, yeah, there's a lot of great stories out there, you know, from traveling and, you know, you travel in situations, all all kinds of different weather and, you know, close calls and things like that. And, 
you know, they're just, there's all kinds of different things out there when you're on the road. But the one thing that I have learned from the road is wherever I get a chance to go, whether it be next week, Emory, Texas, whether it be just coming back from Paris, Tennessee to Grenada, Mississippi to Deland, Florida, and all points in between. I meet fantastic people who have the same passion for the industry, same passion for life that I do, and everybody else does, and they all share it, and they want everybody to have a great time doing it. So that that's the best part of my job about traveling is you meet so many great people who, you know, people say, well, this part of the country has. No, we're all one United States, and I have a chance to find that out. Well said. It doesn't seem like working at all, does it? It doesn't, except for when it's time to tear stuff down. Then it does seem like working again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, Brian, we've talked about agriculture. We've talked about fishing and crappie masters. We've talked about radio, talked about the state fair. We've talked about <laughs> both of our loves for Missouri. What else would you like to share with our OutDrive audience today that you think they might find interesting or maybe inspiring? You know, I think I've said all the inspirational stuff that I can find. I think the most inspirational thing I can do is, you know, step outside. You know, we get some tied up in the office. We get some tied up in business and doing things like that. My suggestion to everybody, and I see it a lot now on, on Facebook, take that second in the morning. You sleep in, you go, yeah, man, I don't want to get up at daylight. One time, get up at daylight. Look at that sunrise. Stay up. Look at that sunset. Stop in the middle of the day and step outside and breathe that air. There's a lot of places that don't breathe the fresh air we do in the state of Missouri. Take a look at that sunrise. Take a look at that sunset. Enjoy what God has given us out there because it is glorious and it's this time of the year. It's even better with the colors and everything like that. But just go enjoy the outdoors. Enjoy what we have. Yes, it's great to have a house, great to have a home, great to have family, great to have that. But share with everybody and just go outside and take a look at it. You know, like I always say, get those kids out there. If they ask you to go fishing, take them fishing. There's plenty of places out there the Missouri Department of Conservation has. You can go to places on, you don't have to have a boat. Go out there on a dock and just go in, go get some worms. Get some worms in a bobber. Go catch fish. You know, whether it be a catfish, a bluegill, whatever. The smile on that child's face is priceless. The smile on your face of the pride that you have for doing it is priceless. So that would be my advice and my inspirational thought for everybody is enjoy what we have out there. Because if you start taking it for granted, it can go away as quick as it can. Take care of your fisheries. Take care of the outdoors. Take care of each other. Very well said, Brian. Very well said. Thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me as a guest. It's been a blast and hope to do it again soon. Yeah, me too. Folks, thanks for listening to OutDrive. I hope you've enjoyed our visit today with Brian Sowers, professional angler, announcer, and USA Tournament Director for Crappie Masters. Come back again next week and I'll take you down the roads of rural America where it is heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCallus.com for show notes and more insight you can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving.